Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 23-24 NABC Rules and Officiating Webinar. I want to thank everyone who's taken the time out of their busy schedules to uh, participate in this. I know uh, it is crazy as, as, as we get close to time, but it's not only crazy for you coaches, but it's also crazy for the officials, uh, the television people, the NCA. So um, I want to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedule as well uh, to get us all ready for this upcoming season. Um, for today's event, I'd like to introduce uh, former Mexico and St. John's head coach and current ESPN analyst, uh, Fran Fraschilla, to be our moderator. Coach Fraschilla, thanks again for being here and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, Troy. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, most of you know that I spent uh, 23 years as a college basketball coach, last 21 at ESPN, 42-year uh, member of the NABC, and um, uh, very happy to be moderating this panel today. I'll just say a couple things before we introduce our esteemed guests. Um, I know the rules better now than I ever did as a college coach. Uh, when you're on TV and you don't know a rule, you're not an expert. And uh, quite frankly, it's something that I've become passionate about, knowing the basketball rules, understanding officiating, uh, understanding the coach dynamic with officials. Um, I would hope that I don't need Gene Sterator to bail me out when, um, when I'm doing a game on ESPN. I, I feel that strongly about the rules. From a coach's standpoint, uh, I didn't have to know every single rule when I was coaching because I could always sidle up to a guy like Chris Rastatter and say, Chris, are we allowed to sub right here? Or how do they get away with that? Or how come we can't call a timeout in a situation? Um, now, um, it's completely different for me, as I said. I honestly think the rules can win you a game or two a season. Um, and uh, I just think it's critical in the off season that you grab the rule book, the case book, study it. Uh, if you don't have the time to do it, you should have somebody on your coaching staff that becomes an expert on the rules. Um, it's I'm, I'm fanatical about it, and I, I hope that uh, this particular uh, seminar with the new rules and some uh, coach officiating dynamics uh, will help everybody as they get ready for the season. And there are one or two major rule changes this year or uh, points of emphasis as well as well that I our, our panel will get into. Uh, first, uh, the NCAA's men's basketball coordinator of officiating, longtime outstanding official, now doing an incredible job of organizing the rules for the officials and for our game. Chris Rastatter uh, is on um, from the uh, the Division Two coordinator of uh, rules for the NCAA and also the uh, National. Uh, Junior College uh, Association Rules uh, Coordinator, John Blazik, and the NCAA's uh, Secretary of Rules Editor, uh, Jeff O'Malley, are on. Uh, Jeff, I know you'll join us here. And thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Um, Chris, let's start with you. Just give us an okay. overview of... Uh, of the new rule changes and, and um, what you see for the game this year. And then we'll get into the specifics. Okay. Thanks, Fran. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is probably my favorite call of the year. I think Fran, mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. So I, I, I'm actually looking forward to a little uh, interaction and back and forth. Okay, everybody. I hope everybody has watched the coaches video because what we laid out in that are, are the changes and uh, plays of interest, I think I called them, and a couple of uh, interpretations that are gonna have an effect on the game. So the biggest one obviously is the, the legal guarding position. You know, the rule where now a defender, and it can be a primary or secondary defender, but the play that it will happen most often is, you know, is the drive to the basket with the secondary defender to come over to help and, and try to take a charge. So the, the restrictions, there's only the, the rule change. What Jeff, like maybe five words, right? In yeah, last, exactly. Yeah. The last line of that rule, the only thing that changed for the entire legal guarding uh, position rule is that defender now needs to be set before the offensive players last foot, touches the floor. 
So I know during the summer when I was teaching this, I used the term plant foot as just sort of look that foot that that dribbler would be shooter, you know, hits the floor and then he, then he alights. So that defender needs to be set before that foot hits the floor. The rule used to be it was before that offensive player left the floor before he actually alighted. So the time frame is the difference here. That defender needs to be there much earlier in the sequence. So uh, I had a number of plays <clears throat> on the coach's video and I brought a couple of those plays. Actually, I brought three plays that can show Look, in the, in the standard block charge, and I know you guys have heard, I know you guys have heard some of the banter going around, and I just want to be real clear. There's no percentages. There's no, you know, we don't have the data. All I know is I've watched a bunch of these plays, and if that secondary defender has to come from, say, the opposite lane line to come over and help, he's going to be late. I can just tell you he's going to be late. If a secondary defender, the help defender, is, like, already there, and they just – all he needs to do is step out of the restricted area, for example, then there's a good chance that he'll be on time. So you can still have a charge in that situation. Don't get caught up and it's always going to be a block, but it's <laughs> on those stock plays, it's going to be a block. We put it in because we wanted to stop that crash at the basket because kids are getting hurt. So we want to avoid that. And, and, and I like the rule. So really that's probably the biggest rule change uh, uh, for me, the other, the other interpret, it's not really interpretation. It's, it's the way the rule is written. It's just how we're going to ref it. Now it's called straight line path. And I put that in the coach's video. That's a point of interest play. I believe straight line path rule 10, one, 12. When that offensive player is going a to B and nobody's in front of him, he's allowed to go a to B that defender, even though he may be moving legally and laterally can't bump or push or contact that player, set him off his path, uh, that, that's illegal. That's a defensive foul. That defender needs to get in front of the offensive player, get in that offensive player's path. Uh, and when that happens, now the onus of the contact is now on the offensive player. So I have two plays that will be very clear. I think in years past we went with, you know, look, you establish – and then you can move laterally or you can move obliquely. I get all that. But if you move obliquely and you move into a straight line path, you know, the, that the offense have obtained, the foul's on the defense. That's a blocking foul. We've gone, we've gone so far the other way that we were calling those charges. And I'll show you a couple of plays. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you all will agree that that's, that cannot be an offensive foul. So those are the two biggest plays. I know J.O. has – some of the rules, you know, relative to shot clock resets, basket interference, goal 10 in the review, and, and I'll let him get into those. The, but these are plays that are going to happen, you know, multiple times a game. So, Franny, I think for me, that's that's probably yeah. a, a J.O., good why don't you why don't you cover the, uh, the, the, the you know, there's not a lot of new rules, but there are a few that are going to affect the game. Why don't you get into that and then we'll get to John and then come back to the video. Sure. Happy to, Brown. Um, you know, Chris talked about the, the biggest one, which is the change to the legal guarding position rule. Um, you know, like he said, too, it's a, from a from a rules writing standpoint, it's really not that big of a change. But I know from an impact to the game, um, it's really going to be a big, uh, a big change for this upcoming season and, and the way it's officiated. Um, we, we did make a change to, to our shot clock reset rule where, you know, any time a pass or deflection or a shot. Uh, hits the rim in a um, in a team's front court. We, we're going to reset that if they gain regain possession of that. So it makes it easier to officiate. Um, you, the the officials don't have to try and interpret whether or not it was a shot or a pass. Um, and this really aligns with uh, the NBA rule. They they have a very similar rule. So it's, so we we enacted that. So anytime uh, anytime that ball hits the rim. Uh, it's going to be a reset unless it's on a throw in. So a throw in that hits the rim is not going to is not going to reset. Um, but, you know, if, if the throw in gets deflected, the throw in is an ends. And if that hits the rim, uh, we are going to reset in that situation. So uh, that's a big change. You know, technology on the bench. We've experimented with it for, I think, probably the last four years. Um 
that is uh, that is in the rule book now. So there's no longer a need for the conference to uh, to file a waiver. Um, so you you know coaches are able to use live and preloaded video on the bench for coaching purposes. Um, the other one of the other rules too is uh, we are going to review basket interference and goaltending calls. Um, all of them, or not all of them, but all of them can be reviewed. So it's a voluntary voluntary review for the officials. If coaches request it um, and it's not overturned, uh, they can be charged a timeout. But those, will, except for some instances, for the most part, those are going to be reviewed at the electronic media timeouts the same way we do two to three point shots. Um, there are some instances where if the call, like if the basket interference goaltending call takes us to an electronic media timeout, it's going to, we're going to review that and then, um, you know, award the ball appropriately based on that. But for the most part, you know, if a goaltending basket interference take call takes a, you know, happens at 1820 uh, in the first half, we go to the media timeout at 1545. Uh, we're just going to review that play for, you know, whether or not the points were awarded or taken off the board. So the coaches in the room for the rules committee uh, really felt strongly that we needed to get this play right. This is the only time where officials award or take away points. And it was really important that that aspect of it uh, gets as close to right as we can. So, um that's the biggest one. And then the, the, the last one, I think that that has some impact is for altercation prevention. So if there was a potential fight situation in the past in, in the men's game, only the head coach uh, could come out on the floor to help alleviate or, you know, disengage that, that potential situation. Now it's any non-student personnel can help to alleviate that situation so, you know, if the fight happens down or potential fight happens down towards the baseline, you have the, the strength coach or the trainer down there. Um, they can step in and, and try and get in between those players, uh, whereas, you know, a coach, it may take them a little bit longer. I know, you know, as, as we get older, it takes us a little bit longer to get the places. So, uh, you know, some of the coaches didn't feel like, you know, they could get across the floor in those situations where maybe the, the younger guys could. So, so. They, they still can't participate in a fight, right? If somebody's coming in off the bench um, and they and they participate um, in the fight, they're going to it's going to be adjudicated the same way it has been in years past. But basically, the only people that cannot come in off the bench are, you know, the substitutes, uh, injured players or ineligible players uh, that are sitting on the bench. But basically anybody else. Um, non-student wise can come in and, and help out in those situations. So those are the highlights uh, with that. And, and I think the ones that are going to affect the game the most this year. Hey, John, would you cover table side communication from the official standpoint and how it will affect the coaches? You bet, Fran. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, fellas. This uh, past year, and you'll find between Chris and Jeff and um, the, the rules and mechanics committees, they really, really work hard of trying to make this game better, easier to understand for you guys. But also something this summer, I know uh, Chris Rastatter was a big believer in the committee. This year, when we have a referee make a foul, have a foul call, in the past, they've always come to the table and gone away from you. Well, this year, one of Chris Rastatter's big uh, beliefs is people have to learn how to communicate. So they will be staying on table side this year. So if you have a question, and you ask it in a decent manner, you're probably going to get a response. But they're going to stay table side this year just to help our communication. Plus, if anybody's wearing numbers 77, 88, 99, we want to make sure we don't have book errors with that because it's hard to put those hands up, those numbers up on your hands if you haven't tried. So it's going to be, a, I think, a really good improvement for the game of communication. And uh, the Rules Committee was really, really supportive of that. Let me just say a couple things about the uh, coaching as it relates to the rules. And then, Chris, you take it away and show us some video. Uh, number one, I, I would I'm a fanatic about organization. I would absolutely practice uh, altercation prevention in practice. I really would. I would make create a couple situations, obviously fabricated, where something happens and your players start to leave the bench 
and your coaches and strength coach actually practice that because it it it's it I don't want to say it's likely to happen um but during my course of a season it happens probably four or five times during a game where something uh, an altercation is potentially uh, uh combustible so I would practice all altercation prevention that's the first thing secondly I love the new table side communication because um, I did this. I don't even remember what the rule was when I coach. It's been so long, but I see my coaching brethren yell at an official from across the court about a call. And even if you're doing it in a manner that's appropriate, it just looks bad because you're trying to get the, the official's attention. Now, when they come over to the table, if to, you know, to the point, I think John made, if you're, you know, discreet about it, you could probably make a point to an official and from Chris's standpoint, uh, as we've talked about, he's very big on having of of his officials having improved communication skills with with coaches. Um, he thinks it's important, and I do too. And then the last thing, as it relates to basketball, you know, those of you who are playing help side defense, no middle or whatever, which is not a new concept, by the way. Um, they've been doing that for fifty years. But uh, help side defenders on the baseline when you force. Uh, sideline baseline your help side defenders are likely to be in position to take a legal charge because they're already there just just a coaching point I'm not telling you how to coach your defense but those are three things from a coaching standpoint that I want you to think about with that Chris do you want to go back and cover those plays that uh that you can just make crystal clear what what the legal guarding position will be this year yeah I can Fran I, I want to piggyback on two on two things real quick if I can and, and sure. I think couple questions uh, uh first with the communication piece look and i'm not speaking for every referee in the country okay but all i know is uh, i'd like us going table side bench decorum is still a point of emphasis so uh, uh and and i get hit pretty good on that in the ncaa tournament they really get after me when our officials don't address it so we just want to address it and, and and look, addressing doesn't mean technical foul. Addressing means let's just address it. But anytime I'm over the, in my career, when I was over in front of a coach, if you're you know side by side, shoulder to shoulder, it was pretty much you can say anything you want to me. Well, we're just here, you know. And 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 I know every official is different, but when we're just sitting side by side talking to each other, just tell me what you think. You know, I I really feel like that was productive more than screaming across. And to Franny's point. Even if you're doing it in a gentlemanly fashion, it still looks, you know, the perception is now you're getting after me and now, you know, now you're showing me up. Okay, now I got to deal with it, you know, so trying to avoid that. Now officials have the option of going opposite side if they feel like like a little time and distance might be a better, a better approach at that particular moment. So I'm just throwing that out there. The, the other thing I want to talk about, get back to J.O.'s, the basketball conference goaltending, and, and I'm sure he said it. But you, there has to be a call on the floor for us to review. You have to put a whistle on the play. So if they don't call basket interference goaltending, there's no review at that media timeout. And then the second piece of that is similar to like when we brought in able to review a shot clock try, you know, if the ball went in, you know, right at the end of the shot clock period, we could go review that. So I think, guys, referees will try to get cute. And they'll try to outsmart the rule and outsmart the video. And, and I really hammered that basket interference goaltending is, is a play that is a reactive type play when you're a referee. It's one of those that you're watching it. And if it trips you, if you in your gut go, oh, th then put a whistle on it because we're pretty good at it. You know, uh, we're pretty good at, at getting those. So if it trips your trigger, great, hit it, and then we'll go look at the appropriate time. But I've told the referees, I don't want you playing games with basket interference, goaltending, you know, waiting 10, 15 seconds, and it's, oh, yo, oh, yeah, no, boom, you know, and then we're going to go, then we're going to look, uh, uh Man, if it's not, it's not. If it is, it is. And if it's an obvious one, if it's a 100 percenter, you know, it's kind of like a two to a three. They're not obligated to go look. So again, that will be a communication piece and sort of a management piece. And if it's look, like, Chris, can, can you just please go, you know what? I'll go look at the media. That's fine. But, but I, I don't want you to get into a, you know, 
you know, hard headed situation because they're not obligated to look, but, but I, I really told them, you know, just referee the play, just referee the play, put everything else, you know, to the side and just referee the play for what it is. So that's their directive. Hey, Chris, can I just ask um, if, if a coach asks you gently on a play like that or some monitor review, that is mm-hmm. there a good chance that you're not necessarily going to charge them with a timeout if in your mind you have a little doubt also? Does that make sense to you? If that totally a makes sense. Look, Fran, I've my whole career, you know, I know it was a three. I know it was a three. Chris, yeah. could you go look at it? It's an immediate timeout. They're, you're not trying to game me. You're not trying to gain an advantage. You just, would you mind? You know what? I'll go look. I'll go look. Now, when I say that, now that's on my own accord. I'm going on my own. I'm going to go look, right? So the, that's all that is. And same thing here. Was that really cool? Would you, you know what? I'll go. Fran, you want me to go? I'll go look. I'll go look. I'll go look. So that, to me, that's, that's you know, why would you not do that? But but I know there's going to be heat in the moment stuff. And I, you know, I, I know there is, you know, I'm not naive enough to think it's all going to be, you know, the purple sky world that I live in when I wake up in the morning and all, everything's, you know, Menza Menza. I get it. So yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a that's just part of the game. And, yeah. and as long as I'm going in that direction, you know, we're now enforce the rules is the, is a point of emphasis. It's not called the rules as written and enforce the rules And in the mechanics manual, I define that, which means you have to find a balance between the art and science of officiating. There's an art to what we do. There's a feel, right? You got to, you know, read the room, so to speak. You just got to understand what's going on in the moment and do what you think is best that will help that situation and help that game. It's not always black and white. So we're, we're, look, the hundred percenters are the hundred percenters. I can't help you with those, right? And we, and we have to get those right. We have to get those right because we lose credibility when we don't. But it's that gray, right, Franny, that you were just talking about right there. That's yeah. that 15 to 20 percent, whatever you think that number is. And that's where we live. And those those are the ones you have to manage. That's your management. That's your feel. What do we just have? You know, there's eight in a row against, you know, red. And there's a, you know, 51-49 play against white. Man, you know, that might not be a bad time for a foul on white. You know, I'm not, you know, we're not manipulating. I, I would never suggest we're manipulating the game. That's not what we do. But you can certainly manage that gray and manage those moments, Fran, that if I just, why not go look at that's just going to bring down the temperature. Why would I not do that? Yeah, that's my thought. Got it. Jeff, you want to jump in here on that? No, I, I think, you know, he he's, Chris has made some great points. The, the, you know, the one thing I would add is I, you know, with Chris's situation about go, going to review, um, you know, it's just a little bit of game management on, on the official standpoint and, and you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to keep peace and and and, and get through the game. I, I think a situation at the end of the game where, where maybe, you know, a coach is trying to use the review to buy an extra timeout are, are situations where, you know what? Hey, I'm a hundred percent sure, and and we're not going to go go look in that situation. But I think for the most part, you know, if you ask with professionalism, for ninety percent of the time, the officials are gonna are, are gonna go look on their own. Yeah, John, yeah. anything to add there? Yeah, Fran. Um, I know a bunch of the guys that are listening on here. You know, I'm a retired college football coach, so I'm a coach's referee, and I am really big on communication. I learned a long time ago. And I love Chris's philosophy. The three, the three little thoughts. If you ask a question, you deserve an answer. No different than if I ask my dentist a question. If you make a statement, we got to keep working. Then if you make a comment that you probably wouldn't make to your AD or president, we may have to address it. But I think that's a big thing. I love the communication piece, staying at table side this year. I think it'll be great for the game, Fran. Yeah, I do. I do too. I'm. I'm just going to reiterate one more time for. I know we got a lot of coaches on here, nearly 300. Um, you know, this is not. I, I learned after I left coaching that um, I, I was adversarial, but in a polite way. I would lose my mind because I'm Italian, and then 90 seconds later, realize I was a complete idiot. And and oftentimes the officials that refereed me understood that. You know, and a lot of you guys are like that, but. I just think the more you uh, as coaches learn the job that the officials have, 
whether it's not just studying the rule book and the case book, which I think is important, take it on vacation with you, you know, comes out in I think late August or early September, right, Chris? September-ish, right? Jeff, you would know better. Yes. yes. And, yeah. And, and August it should be yeah. out. And, and it, it's, uh, it's fascinating how many things are in there that make you think about how you're going to coach your team actually. And, um, but I think the other thing is any chance you get during the summer, if you're at an AAU tournament and, you know, the Big 12 or the SEC are running an officiating camp for their young guys, um, it, it's just so common sense to get to know these guys and understand that there's three teams out there. You know, there really are. Um, it's 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 the opponents and the officials. And, and Chris, I've said oftentimes in a game I've broadcast, now that I, I'm a neutral observer, um, that a game got physical at the end of the first half. And I'll say it was, we start the second half, both teams have got to be ready for the officials to blow the whistle because they want this game under control. And uh, you have to adjust as a player and a coach. It's that simple. And if you don't adjust to uh, the, the rules, the officiating and just the relationships and the personalities, you're really doing your team a disservice. And um, I, I'm far better now watching these guys and realizing how good they are on a nightly basis than I was when I was coaching when it was a little adversarial because you're, we all know what's at stake in your career. So just, just to add that as we move on and Chris, before you show some highlights, I don't know if you want to address that at all. Uh, absolutely. Fran. I, I, that's a terrific point. Look, we make adjustments throughout the game when we're talking at a, you know, an immediate timeout and we're all three down there. Talk, we're talking about what, you know, what's going on here or, or even during the play, if you ever see a referee, you know, look at another one and kind of give it, you know, that thing. That's like, hey, dude, we got to tighten up because we're losing this thing. So we make those adjustments. And at halftime, if we feel like we really let it go, yeah, we might come out with a little bit, maybe, uh, you know, maybe a little tipping it, maybe, you know, maybe a little bit just just to reel it back in, you know, and then and then and then try to turn them loose. Look, we, we, we don't want to put whistles on place. We'd rather just have the game run up and down. Trust me, we're really good when the ball goes in, it's free flowing. That's great for us, but you got to, you know, you got to, you got to referee the game that you're given that night. So, uh, you want to show some highlights, coach, before we move on, oh, please, um, just for everybody on, uh, we highly encourage questions. We want questions. We want, uh, interaction. Um, some people have already started to throw some questions in the Q and a, uh, portion of the zoom. Uh, which is great. I know Jeff's answered a couple of them already. Um, I'm going to give one here right now, but I also want to point out that there's a, um, a raise your hand portion of Zoom. And if there's a question that you would like to ask the panelists directly, I have the opportunity to open up your mic and you can ask the questions of them directly if it's something you want to um, converse with the panelists or the Q&A session. Either way, we'll have questions. But the first question came in from Coach Matt Elkin. Uh, when is it appropriate, if ever, for an assistant or support member to respectfully address an official during the game or during a timeout? And what is the best way to approach this question or commentary? Chris, and before you answer, I, I got three technical fouls as an assistant coach. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, and one time in a very close game, Villanova Providence working for Rick Barnes it, with five minutes to go. Luckily, we won. <laughs> I would have been out of As much as that surprises me, <laughs> you know, I will. Uh, hey, look. I've always been assistant coaches are, are, are friends. You know, there's an ally on a bench. Uh, they can generally be a voice of reason, you know? So I always had good relationships with the assistant coaches. Now there's a time and place, you know, you know, so if there's heat of the moment, you know, this game's going on and we're battling and now you're going to stand up and start barking about something. Whoa, 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 whoa. But maybe during the timeout, that's your opportunity to have a little chit chat. And uh, I always enjoyed relationships with assistants. But there's certainly, there's certainly on a leash that you know you would, you know you you would give the head coach much more latitude than you would an assistant, you know, in a in a you know in a moment, so to speak. John, you have any issue with that? Yeah, I think uh, something we all want to remember: the assistants, when you want to come out, don't come out to the middle of the floor because the other team knows you can't do that. But if you just nod your head, these guys are going to come over and talk to you because we also know in the heat of the battle. Just like Chris said, you know, the head coach is focusing so much. You may need to put the word in A. You need to get 12. Help me out a little bit. Assistant coaches are really valuable to us. It's how you approach, because referees will talk to you. Just how you approach it. You just can't run out in the middle of the floor like some of you do at the start of the game. 
Chris wants us to communicate. So do I. I think that's a big thing right there. How you approach somebody. And you know what, friend? You know, assistant coaches turn into head coaches. So when you build yeah, those relationships, I mean that it, there's nothing cooler than than to, than to like see a player. You know, they play all the year, then they become a coaches on it, and you just have this relationship. The same thing with the assistants, and now they turn into heads. And it's uh, it's uh, to me that's a great part of the game. Yeah, we have a question here that you guys and I discussed yesterday, uh, and uh, most many of the people on this call know I have another NABC member uh, coaching. Um, and we had this discussion last week, Chris. It's more it's more coaching, but I'd love your opinion. The idea now that the more difficult it is to be legally guarding may lead to more like one foot drives, quick drives, athletic guys, guys that you know you watch nightly in the NBA, and <clears throat> that very very well may be good for the game uh, to express that athleticism. Uh, but here's a question that says, "I'd love your thought on teaching players to play off one foot," which I just talked about. Versus two feet, uh, my son Matt at Harvard, who played at Villanova, coached at Villanova, his thing was, well, we're still going to teach two feet also because coming to a two foot stop it gives you more time to process the play, as opposed to bang bang to the rim. And I know I know that's not exactly a uh, something in your purview, but the it does kind of make sense since this is a coaching seminar. Mm -hmm. Just just your mm -hmm. thought, Jeff. Let's go to you, Jeff. Your thought on that. Yeah, and I, I think the the intent of the rule, the discussion in the room when, when this decision was made to do this was, you know, Chris talked about it a little bit earlier, right, to prevent some of the crashes around the basket. But the main, uh, the main reason why this rule was made was to give the offensive player more time to adjust to late defensive movement, right? So, so if that's going to be off of one foot, and, and I've heard that some coaches are teaching that, you know, just – just, you know, staying off at two feet and just, you know, leaving uh, leaving off of one foot, if that's going to help them uh, create or, or more opportunity uh, to adjust, then I, I think that that's better for the game. Um, you know, friend, the, the flip side of this, too, and we can get into it later, is like, how are now how are these plays going to be defended now? So and, and what's the best way to do it? And, and there's been a lot of talk, too, on the flip side of, you know, these defenders are going to have to go vertical and start blocking shots again, right? So we're going to have to get back to, to shot blocking uh, as yeah. part of the game as opposed yeah. to taking charges. That's come up in my travels around the Big 12 with, and yep. Curtis Sean had this, and I had this discussion, John. Can you talk, John and uh, Chris, about playing vertical now at the rim and how that might be an effective coaching strategy? Chris? Yeah, well, you know... Uh... We've we've always had since we put in the restricted area. If you you know if you leave the floor, then there's no longer a restricted area. That rule does not apply. So as long as you jump vertically, so I think that is what Jeff's talking about. Look, if you leave your feet and you make a play on the ball, well now it's just a basketball play. It's no longer that block charge play. It, it's a basketball play. Now you make you know so you're just attempting to block the shot. That's so that that's a different play to referee. Now you just now you you know adjudicating verticality. As an old coach, John, would you teach that? To block the shot? Well, the, ver the verticality portion at the rim, it's it's a little unnatural un un until recent years when we put the restricted arc in. But now it makes sense that you are illegal if you if you just jump vertically, right? Yes. And by all means, Correct. I would teach that. And here's why. From a referee standpoint, we watch it to go straight up. That's pretty easy compared to coming out of your cylinder. And I think if you teach, if somebody would teach shot blocking more, you'd have less fouls on the big guys, in my thoughts. Going straight up. Yeah, it's great. Do you have anything you want to add on that since you're the rules guy? No, I think the 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 key to that is it has to be straight up, right? You, you mm -hmm. have to jump from A to A. Um, so you have to be legal and, and then jump straight up in the air um, to, to remain legal. Now, you can be illegal and cleanly block a shot. But in order to be, you know, to absorb contact at that point, you have to be set in the legal guarding position, jump straight up and return back to that same spot. And I would just add, Chris, during the season, when I see a play like that on TV, if we're calling it, oftentimes he's not A to A, he's A to B and the coach goes nuts. But yeah. in reality, he has not he, he has not been vertical because he's moved. Right. And 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 it and it's that help defender, Fran. We were talking about when we were showing the play earlier before everybody got on. If he's coming from the weak side, coming all the way across the key to help on a drive to the basket, 
he's got less of a chance to be vertical. And that's a key for a referee. So, so like the lead official, the guy underneath, his job is when that ball goes, when he puts that ball on the floor and he's coming to the basket, everybody's everybody in the crew, hey, here comes a restricted area play. So the lead's job is to get to that secondary defender as early as he can. If he's coming from the opposite side, you know, look, I'm going to let the play finish and I'm going to process it. I'm not going to put a quick whistle on it, but I know in my head, boy, he better get here because that's a long way to come to to be a secondary defender. Do you want to show a play or two, Chris? I, I can, unless we want to go. Troy's got more questions. Let, let's show, uh, let's see, we, we do have questions. Show one play. You showed us a play yesterday that was so logical, it just makes sense. Okay, I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to show the, uh, I'm going to show a plant foot play, a last foot play the from Colorado. And all these plays, everybody, are on your, on your, uh, on the coach's video. All right, everybody got me? We're sharing the screen. Okay, here we go. So you see secondary defender comes from all the way to the opposite side. Now this baseline angle gives you a really good look at, at the rule itself. Okay, so, and that's even a little late. I think I think it looks to me like his heel's on the floor. That, that secondary defender, blue 14, already needs to be established. Two feet on the floor facing the opponent, and he's clearly not there. So you can see that he's late. Last year, that's a charge, Chris, right? Last year, that's a charge. Let's disregard the restricted area on that play because uh, I'm just more for the more for the the rule. Okay, so here was the point I'm trying to make. So comes over the top of the screen. Defender goes over the top. He's uh, so he's out of the play. Here, it's a restricted area play. That's what we're all thinking now because he's putting the ball on the ground. He's going to the basket. This guy's got to come a long way to go from across the key to get there by the time he sees what's going on. You see how late he is when you're referee. So now his job is to pick up this secondary defender all the way from over here. As soon as he turns the corner and starts coming, he's got to find this guy. And that guy's late. His foot's on the ground. He's not even there. He hasn't even established. That's an easy play. So what we've been talking about, and and I don't have percentages, everybody. I know some people and throwing out some numbers because we don't keep that data. We don't have the you know, the personnel, you know, you know, to keep that kind of data. But but most of those, generally speaking, that's your that's your standard stock textbook, you know, secondary defender, block charge play at the basket, elevated offensive. It's going to be a block. And Chris, go back to that play one more time and let's take it from sure. the standpoint of verticality here. Okay. What would he what would the defender if he can't get there in time? What would he have to do to be legal in terms of playing straight up and down A to A? Well, that's the whole point, Fran, is he yeah. needs to get to here yes. to establish. So look, right. so let's just say he gets there. You know, he can jump at that point and make a play for the ball. And that would not be a charge. If he jumps up, no, it all depends on the contact. Yeah. But he needs to jump and make a play for the basketball. And if if the contact is beyond marginal. Yeah. Then it's a defensive foul. But what helps him here is if he goes A to A straight up to the ceiling. He's got to go A to A. But again, when you're coming from here and you're coming yeah. across the help, those yeah. are the times that's going to be your A to B where he's got just it. not getting there. You think they are because the hands are, you know, straight up. Hey, I'm straight up. Well, yeah, but you jump from you jump from about here, you know, and you landed over here. And and I think that this is a good play because I think. My sense from a coaching standpoint is many of the blocks are going to be called on drives from the from the top of from the top of the court. Yeah, yeah. because the the help is not usually set like it would be on like a no middle. Everybody's loading five guys to the ball. Right, right. Now here's a here's a little bit of a different play. So now, dude puts the ball on the floor. Everybody's thinking restricted area. Look where the secondary defender is. I mean, he's there. All he has to do at this point is get out of the restricted area. That's all he needs to do. Now he doesn't, you know, for him, he stops in the restricted area. So this is going to be a defensive foul, but look how, do you see the space? Can everybody see my cursor? There is so much space between this secondary defender 
and the offensive player. That's what we're looking for. That was the intent that J.O. is talking about. This guy has all kinds of time to adjust. He can pull up. He can take another step. He can Euro. He can do a lot of things. And if this dude just had that right foot out to here and his left foot out to he's legal. He is there in time because he didn't have to come from anywhere. He was already there. Hey, he just Chris, didn't get out far enough. But that on space. This play, on this play, uh, if he's, just to clarify, because he's in the restricted arc, he can play vertically here legally. He's got to he's jump. Yeah. Yeah. He's got to make a play in the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Something I would practice if I were coaching. But I, my point is, you know, the, the, and I have one more play to show as long as we're showing them. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the standard play that we just showed, that stock play, that defender is going to be late. I'm just telling you they're going to be late. When there's this much space, okay, and, and our lead has picked this guy up early, he didn't have to go anywhere. He's there. So all I need to make sure is he's out of the restricted area. There's a good chance this will be an offensive foul. And it would have been had he been out of the restricted area. And then one last play, just to throw you guys a curve, because we see this a lot. The runover plays, you know, where, where the defender gets set and then the offensive player just runs him over. That rule hasn't changed. That's all the same. So on this play, you think dude's gonna you think dude's gonna jump off the one foot, and this is gonna back to the one foot thing, but he doesn't. He puts that left foot down. Everybody see that? Rather than elevating on his right foot and going for a layup. So if he's going to elevate, dude's late. But he takes that second step, that last step with his left foot and puts it down right in between, right in between the feet of the secondary defender. On these plays, once that left foot goes down, that makes that defender legal because he was there before that last foot hit the floor. I hope that makes sense. If he, if he alights off his right foot and goes to the basket, that's a block. But he takes another step, that changes the play. Similar to what Fran was talking about, a jump stop. When that player gathers and then he lands on both feet legally in a jump stop, great. Okay, well, that play's done. Now it's a new play. And if that defender is set, any contact now there is, is, is attributable to the offense. So that's going to be an offensive foul. If he continues to go through the defender. I mean, if he stops and does something different, great. But if but if he jumps, stops, lands on two, and then goes into the defender, it's an offensive foul. That defender is legal now that he put that last foot down. This is an offensive foul. What you're saying is he's he the defender is there before the plant foot, the left foot awkwardly becomes the plant foot. Yes, that is the last foot to touch the floor. You're right. And 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 Franny on this one, he it's not even really a plant foot in you know, traditional terms, because he's not trying to elevate. He just ran through the dude. He's just trying to go to the basket, you know, so that's a run over. That's an offensive foul. Hey, Jeff, so that, quick player, quick. that offensive player, generally speaking, everybody yeah. puts that foot, that last foot down so close to that defender, it's going to be an offensive foul because that makes mm -hmm. that defender legal. <clears throat> hey, Jeff, real quickly, this happens a couple times a year. What's the adjudication of the Blarge? Because I, so, I, I read the rule and it's a little, it's a little, you know, dicey. Yeah. It, if you have a situation where one official calls a block and the other official calls it, calls a charge, it's going to be a double foul. They're going to go to the table and, and they're going to assess a, assess a foul to each player. If the <laughs> ball is, if the ball is still in the shooter's hand, um, it is not going to count. Uh, if the ball is already away, um, then the basket will count. So the one change that we made this year is, in the last two minutes uh, of the game, the officials can go to the monitor now to determine if that defender was in the restricted area. That's the only thing they can go look at in that situation, but they can go look to see if that defender is in the restricted area. So that could um, that could clear up the large call uh, in that instance. Um, but that is, I see John raising his hand there. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead and finish, Jeff. I want to go back yep. to a point that Chris made that was really good. Go ahead on your large. I'm done. I'm done oh, with it. Can I, let me just add on to that. And and this is a little behind the curtain for everybody. So this is a secondary defender. It's a play at the basket. And I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but that is the leads call. This guy out here has no business putting a whistle on this play. And I hammered that home in my clinics this year. I'm hammering whistle discipline and coverage discipline, which means – 
you have to know your responsibility in each play and ref to it. Your eye shouldn't be wandering. Ref to your responsibility. And if that is not your primary play, then do not have a primary whistle. That's this guy's play. This guy shouldn't have a whistle. Now, on a play like that and the lead doesn't blow, okay, now the center can come in because that's a play that needed a whistle. So just, you know, we talk about these things. We talk about coverage and discipline and knowing your responsibility. I'm just, I'm so big on that. So we shouldn't really ever have three whistles on a play. You know, sometimes it happens because plays just, you know, it happens. Okay. But just generally speaking on a, on a play like that, that's a one whistle play from the right guy. So we talk about that and that, and that will make us better. Cause when we, when we go outside our primary area coverage, our percentages go down. Now I know you're going to use that game one. You're going to say, "Hey, you're out of your primary. Your percentage is going to go down. You got to be more disciplined." Okay. <laughs> I, I Chris said, you. "Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, but Coach, just- coaches, I coaches, I studied, I studied the mechanics, and when I went to AAU games, I would get on the officials, say, "Hey, you're, you know, you're getting straight lined. You're not in position. Yeah. Don't yeah. move." Yeah. But uh, John, add to this, please. I just want to go back and pigtail off <clears throat> the plays you guys, you coaches, just watched. It's been really interesting to work with Chris for the past year. He just finished his four national, him and Jeff national meetings because they meet with all Division One and a lot of the Division Two referees. You can see how good those two guys break plays down. And just in these three plays, I don't know if you coaches picked up on this. If you noticed on the big man where Chris was talking about, if he was out of the arc, the distance from the offensive player to the defensive player compared to the block charge, how close the last leg was for the offensive player going up. This is how minute those guys break these clips down on teaching. Who's calls this? Who's primary? Who's secondary? It's been really good to watch referees learn this. And watching that, that's how we break plays down as referees. That was a great teaching point on where your kid leaves the floor compared to where the defensive kid was. How much room's there? And if you picked up one thing, the wider the space, the wider the space, probably the better the call is going to be made from a block charge. Just, just I just picked that up just watching this with him on, on look at the distance between the offensive and defensive player. Bang, bangs. You agree with that, Chris? I do, JB. Yeah, the more space, the, the better chance there will be an offensive foul. So, the, mm-hmm. look – there's going to be a percentage of offensive fouls. I know you've heard it'll never be offensive. Well, I don't, I don't, I didn't teach that. I don't teach that when I was talking to the guys. There can be offensive fouls. So process the play. You got to get to the defender early. First, you got to recognize what's going on. When that dude puts the ball on the floor, goes to the basket. Everybody has to recognize restricted area. Here it comes. Find your matchup. Find your secondary defender. Let the play happen and then process it. I'm I'm really big on not putting an immediate whistle on a play. Some of the hundred percenters, okay, you need to, you know, hit if you need to hit and go get it, fine. But on these plays, just process it. So when I say process it, here's what the referee does. I'll see a play, and then I'm telling you, you can run it back really quickly in your mind. That's processing. I'm going to give it, you know, I'm doing my own replay, and I go, you know what? Yeah, I got it. Beep, beep, that's a block. You know, so so not an immediate whistle. And then so the secondary whistle, we call that a cadence whistle from one of the other referees. That's going to be even more delayed. So they process it one or two times, and then it's like, really, no whistle on that play? Okay, for whatever reason, okay, I'm going to come get it because that play needed a whistle. That's See how that, Fran? That, that is refereeing 101 right there talking about processing a play. That's, That's 401, JB. Pardon me? That's 401. I took it up because, you know, the coaches were up here, Okay. We are yeah. way up here today. <laughs> I'm with you guys. Uh, hey, uh, Troy, before you get a couple questions in, let me just say this to add to uh, Chris. Uh, as as a coach, you should have no problem with a whistle, uh, with a with a referee being a half count late on his whistle, not the call, because he's because to hit to Chris's point, I have I have no problem calling a game when the referee delays the whistle to get in his mind the play right. Your fans go nuts because they think the indecision means he's not sure. But I would say, Chris, 95 times out of 100, he's processing to make sure 
that he 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 reviews it quickly in his mind, and I've got to you know I've got to call, and and your fans go nuts, but you need to understand, and you probably do instinctively, but you want to react to the official blowing the whistle a little bit late, and that's your in to get into the referee, which I think is, you know, it's it is what it is, but you just understand they're trying to get the call right. You're uh, trying to see the whole trying to see the whole play. That's yeah. the that's yeah. the biggest part of it. And I I would venture to say, Chris, too, that probably a call accuracy in that situation is a lot higher uh for an official than than if they called, you know, right on contact. Yeah, I, I would agree I would agree with that. Troy, you got uh you want to throw a couple questions out there? Uh sure, coach. Um <clears throat> we had one question here is why are teams allowed to gather at their bench during a video review? Too many times these reviews last several minutes and provide a team without any timeouts or remaining chance to talk strategy. This seems unfair. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, that that actually came up uh, part of the discussion in, in the rules committee to, you know, if we wanted to keep teams in the key area, um, you know, and it, I think that, everybody felt it was just easier to have them go to the benches as opposed to trying to police what is the key area. And then you had coaches yelling across the floor um, instructions at them, um, so forth and so on. So it has been a topic of discussion, uh, but the committee felt, felt like it should stay where we are right now. Great. Hey, Thank Chris, you. One, um, of these, one of these questions, can you briefly, quickly, and, I don't know if you can do it in 90 seconds, but uh, Sean Carney asked, can someone touch on coverage areas by officials? You know, we hear lead, center, slot, and trail. Could, and, and and Sean says, uh, and I didn't know this when I was coaching. Can you just explain that? And just so the coaches have an understanding of the teamwork involved. Sure, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So every position there has a, a primary coverage area. So if you had a, you know, a diagram of the court, for example, the lead would have everything from the, the intersection of the three point arc and the end line up to the first elbow, you know, and then halfway into the key roughly, you know, or even really that just that little triangle that it creates. The center has, you know, everything on their half of the floor. If you divide it, you know, lengthwise, and then the trail has everything else. And then they overlap with coverage. But so that's the kind of the general, but then, and and here's another thing with what I've been teaching. Look, my job is to teach and to train. It's not to, you know, talk down to them and tell them what they're going to do. It's look, here are the, here are the guidelines. We're just teaching you how to be better. So the players, the ball and players dictate everything. They dictate our movement. They dictate our positioning. So, you know, we tell them there's no magic spot on the floor, but if you have a matchup in your primary, and especially if it is a competitive matchup, then you need to be on it. If you're trail and you have the on-ball matchup as you're coming up the floor or in the front court, if that matchup is not competitive, if that defender is five, six feet off of that offensive guy, then my, my vision is past that defender, and I'm looking at the play and what's developing, and, and I might be using that the 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 point guard is the key you know where are his eyes where is he's looking for and so I'm going to see what's developing so you're looking not only at your immediate play but but what's coming so we talk about that too you got to put yourself in a position to see not only your matchup but beyond right and, and the other players so you have your primary so for example on if there's a, a hand check on you know out front on the wing in front of the trail we don't want the center putting a play on that or a whistle on that because that's not his primary that's not his play. Same thing with the lead. Now let's let's talk about maybe a screen. You guys set the high screen way out here in the wing, right? Kind of 28 foot mark in between the top of the key and the sideline, somewhere out in there. And that screener generally is the post player. Well, they'll come up, he'll leave the post area and come up and set that screen. Okay, well, the lead, that's that was his primary area. Now that that defender or that offensive player is leaving his primary and going to set a screen. If I'm lead, I'm staying with that because that's my matchup. So I'm going to extend my coverage out of the post to follow that big all the way up. And I've got the back side of that screen. The trail has the front side of that screen. The lead has the back side of that screen. So it's really just about 
identifying offensive sets and tendencies. And then what, what kind of defense is, you know, what, what is the defense doing? What are they playing? What type of defense are they playing? And that's going to dictate my movement and our coverage. Good I mean, stuff. Kind of John, show. John, you want to add to that at all? Oh, we lost you, John. You're muted, John. Unmuted. Sorry. John. And I think Chris gave a great example. You just go back to, um, if you, if you see a referee, I know as you try to explain this, Chris, it comes really easy to us because that's what we think. But as a coach, if you ask a referee early, hey, show me. I didn't quite understand what Chris was talking about on this, on our primary or secondary. I mean, any referee you have at, the, at our level, they're going to know whose primary are. Chris really works hard, and we all believe you've got to take care of your primary first. And that's the area that's you've got in, in front of you if you're trail leader see. Um, I, I know as a coach, I'm going to talk as a coach for a minute. If I would ask somebody what's uh, in football, what this guy does, I wouldn't understand a thing unless it was on a piece of paper. But I think if you have a college basketball friend, they'll be happy to sit down and talk to you about where primaries and people are looking and watching and things like that. That's just kind uh, of a coach's mentality. I don't want to not answer that, but that's how yeah, I was no, thinking. Listen to Chris. This this is so helpful for coaches. Uh, uh, Eric Reveno, my good friend at Oregon State, I, I think he probably would, we all probably want to know where we are this season on freedom of movement uh, because it's so critical to running offense. So if Jeff or uh, Chris, you want to jump in on that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll go Chris, first. you want to take that? Yeah. 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 It is a, it is a, you know, a major officiating concern. That's how it's listed in the rule book on page six, you know, point of emphasis, right? That's what we call them, freedom of movement. So I, I put under freedom of movement talking about, you know, cutters and screening action and everything we do, everything that in college basketball right now is screen and cut screen and roll screeners, multiple screeners, you know, you're running, you're running players down the end line, come up, catch them all. And we, everything we do is motion and freedom of movement. So, so Eric, to answer your question, we are, we are really big on that. And most of the time when we miss a freedom of movement foul or any kind of freedom of movement action is because we're not officiating where we're supposed to be officiating. So I'm looking over at what, you know, J.O. is refereeing and I miss the screen or illegal screen or holding a cutter uh, over, over here because my eyes aren't where they're supposed to be because I'm not disciplined in my coverage. I don't have an awareness of the offensive set. Look, we need to see, see screens coming well before they are set because if you get to any type of contact, whether it's holding a cutter or definitely whether it's a screen and you see a blow up, your instinct is going to be, oh, that's got to be a block. It's got to be an illegal screen because you didn't see it. So you get fooled by the contact. So screening action, absolutely. Uh, freedom of movement is a point of emphasis. That, that'll that never go away because that's our game, right? I mean, that is that is our game, so. Well, yeah. we can have a double foul on a screen where the defender pl blows up the screener who happens to be moving, correct? If it's an illegal screen, well, if you think, <laughs> what the, if he blows him up beyond, yeah, <laughs> marginal contact you think there was some uh a little bit of intent you can put it you can put a double whistle on that yeah i right, one other thing here because it's really become prevalent in the game and we talked about this yesterday with five out and big guys away from the basket setting screens and dribble handoffs can you explain to the coaches the 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 um the the, the problem with a league offensive player with the ball pivoting in his cylinder to hand the ball off to his teammate while at the same time being careful not to commit an offensive foul and put the legal defender in a in a jam because that seems to happen throughout the year and I can't tell sometimes like why the offensive player with the ball is pivoting into a defender and it's an offensive foul as opposed to being in his own space right yeah, well, yeah, the dribble handoff play, I think there's one on the coach's video on that as well. Ball handlers can be screeners. And I, so whoever started that misnomer that that can't be, that that's wrong. A ball handler can be a screener. So in your example, you know, Franny, the, the, the kid's dribbling up, and now he does a little spin move, 
and and I, after watching this for a number of and missing enough of them, that kid's never in his space. He never stops and then turns in his little, you know, and he's always extends out and creates coverage with a moving defender. So it's an illegal screen. It's going to be an illegal screen. And if that defender just, you know, or the offensive player dribble hand it, you know, he flips it to him and then he keeps running and he runs into a defender who's actively defending the, you know, the new ball handler, that's an illegal screen. You have to give a moving defender time to stop and or change direction. And that's at least one stride. John, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, a little reminder, coaches, teach your kids, remember on their legal screen, they've got to be have, have basically have their feet underneath their armpits. Anything outside, that's pretty easy to see for a referee. And you'll see a lot of kids will think, well, I was there, he was there, but their feet are outside their hips so far and their knees will catch them. And that's just such a simple little skill so we don't get an illegal screen is to keep their feet underneath their armpits and it's a legal screen as long as they're set. John, another way I would coach that would be, and I call it two feet, two hands. Come to a two foot stop, two hands on the ball as you hand it off. You know, it's, I mean, maybe that's junior high level, but to me that makes sense. Two feet on the ground. So you're not moving two hands on the ball. Uh, hey, Jeff, one thing that's come up as a question here. Is there any thought on the rules committee to stopping the clock with a minute to go in the first half? Because what we've I, seen, I, you know, we've seen that teams will not inbound it with the clock running until it gets to 30. And the thought here is it creates an extra possession, like a two for one situation, another possession in the first half. Yeah. I, I know it was a topic of conversation before I took over um this position it has not been since i took over with it so okay. um it has not been on, on the radar uh at least the last couple of years got it i i, uh, I you know i i would venture to say i think you know time of the game uh, you know length of the game and you know was probably played a part in that if if i had to guess um but um that's just an educated guess on my part Got hey, it. Coach uh, Troy, quick, quick, quick question ahead, following up on the moving screens. Uh, Coach Elkins asks, what is the checklist of an official when watching to see if the offense is setting a moving screen? Is it feet moving versus set? Is it leaning with hips or upper body, extending arms, et cetera? What, what is the progression you guys look at? Yeah, great question. So, so the referee, like on my, like on my, uh, trail lead example where the lead is extending following with the big coming up from the post. The trailer is responsible for the, the dribbler, the on-ball defender, the screener, and then the screener's defender. That would be like a one, two, three, four. If you could number those in your head, picture, you know, ball handler, defender, screener, and then screener's defender. One, two, three, four. The lead, conversely, has the screeners defender is his number one the screener is two on ball defender three and then the dribble or four so the the trail is refereeing the top side down and then the, then the lead is refereeing underneath so you've got to get to the screener you have to get to the screener coach to answer your question because that's whose legality you have to judge so yes it is it is feet first because he has to get to a spot and be legal in that spot Right. And, and generally speaking, it is a, you know, if we're talking about a moving defender, right? Because the because the stationary defender, you can come up short of contact. Those are easy. The moving defender. So you've got to now judge, okay, great. He's set. Now, is there enough time for that defender to stop or avoid contact? And that defender's already planted and his and his left foot as he's moving in that direction is in the air, boom, there's contact. That's in the legal screen because that wasn't enough time. But if he sets that screen, his right foot's planted, then his left foot goes down, and then he runs into the screen, legal, in terms of time. Then the second aspect of that is what JB was talking about. Now you got now you got to judge the body, and if and if the feet are really wide, and the contact is in the leg of the screener, that's an illegal screen. If the feet are wide and the contact is in the torso of the screener, we pass on that because the contact is here. The feet and the width of the feet were was ir was irrelevant to the play. So yeah, you go, you got to get whoever's responsible for that screener. And in my example, it's the lead. You've got to get to that screener and you follow that screener. 
you referee the defender on the screener on the way up because that defender's job is to is to keep the screener from getting to you know where he wants to go to set the screen. So you might hold or bump the screener, right? So you've got to referee that all the way up. But when it comes to now we're setting the screen, okay, now I've got to all my attention on the screener. And out top the trail, his his attention is on the defender. So that's why screens are two referee plays. All screens are two referee plays for that reason. Because they ask one referee to referee that entire sequence, man, you're asking a lot. I don't care how good these dudes are. That's a hard play. So it's a help play. One on the top, one on the backside. Chris, on that dribble handoff, when the, the when the offensive player comes to a two-foot stop, uh, you probably answered this, but I, I want to clarify it. Is there a time and distance issue when the defender is in the, the, the player with the ball is in the vision of the defender? So in other words, if he's legal before there's, if he's got two feet on the ground before mm-hmm. there's contact, is it incumbent on a defender to avoid the contact in that situation? If the defender is moving, Fran, then that screener needs to give that defender one normal step, right? Okay. Basically time. And we, and we say time to stop and or change direction. Got it. So, so if you, you don't give him that full step and there's contact, that's a block. It's an illegal screen. So you could come to a stop on a DHO, dribble handoff. Yeah. But if it's not timely, in other words, you haven't given that defender who's moving time to readjust, that would be a block. That's correct. Okay. That's uh, something I think we all struggle with. By the way, coaches, it drives me nuts when your big guys set illegal screens during the season. Honestly, I see it three times a game at least. And I say it not to be uh, hurtful, but just it's something that, you know, your kids just need to be, uh, you know, I guess be blunt, just need to be coached on because it's really avoidable if it's practiced. I I think, Chris, I just think you probably see it three or four times a game, John, uh, moving screens by big guys. Yeah. Yeah. And look, we and we're not and we're not splitting hairs on screens. And we talk about that. I'm not a hair splitter or anything, man. Get the obvious. So if it's if it's really close then you maybe pass on it, then maybe get to the big or you get to the assistant and say, hey, your big has got to be there a little you know, a little more set or his feet a little wide, whatever the case may be, right? And have that conversation. But if it's an obvious one, you you, know, you got to hit it. I've been, told, the game. I've been told by one of your colleagues that the offensive line blocking block, block out will be uh, adjudicated forcefully this year where the guy just you know, defensively on the block out, he just doesn't even follow the ball. He just, is yeah. that something that's been brought up or did someone just oh, tell yeah, me? No, yeah, we talk about it all the time. I sent out clips last year. I had a whole, you know, I sent out in-season videos of these dudes, eight of them in the year that they have to watch to be eligible to referee the tournament. We have eligibility requirements, right? Yeah. So I talk about that. So look, when the when the ball goes up in a shot, now to turn and face your opponent in and of itself is not illegal. And if there's a little marginal contact, not illegal. But now if you start, you know, holding, it's like anything. You're holding, pushing, uh, foul, foul. And again, even on rebounding action, each referee has a responsibility, a matchup that they have to referee. So if you're watching something you're not supposed to be watching, you're going to miss that. Troy, what are we doing time-wise here? I could I could talk to these guys for eight hours, but. <laughs> it's, it's up to you guys. Um on how long you you have available for us. I'm sure the answers, the questions will never stop. Yeah, I I just would reiterate one more time, coaches, that this is such a big part of the game. There's such an advantage. Uh, You know, a couple of things that jump out at me, uh, guys, that I'd love for you to explain. The fact that a player touches the net while the ball is above the cylinder but not on the rim would you explain the idea of what is goaltending or basket interference vis-a-vis a player touching the rim or the net? Yeah, so uh, it, technically a player is not allowed to touch the net while the ball is is on the cylinder or in the cylinder, right? So, But there is uh, – a couple of years ago, we did put some leeway in there where, you know, if – if there is, uh, if it doesn't affect the play, um, you know, if it doesn't vibrate the rim, so forth, that the referees can't ignore it in that situation. It gets a little more tricky when that ball is laying on the rim uh, and a player contacts the net. Um, you know, in, in that situation, you're probably going to, you're going to see it called uh, more often in that case. Uh, along those lines, Chris, um, 
with the new uh, monitor review of basket interference and goaltending, mm -hmm. if there's a play at the rim, two, two uh, A and B are jumping for it, and the call is uh, the a, player A violates the rule. Let's say the offensive player violates the rule. It's not called, but the officials call the second guy, B, defensive player, for violating the rule. And you go to the monitor. The call has been made on the second action. Is that reviewable? And 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 can you penalize A for being the first guy to, to let's say touch? This this is right right up Jo's alley. Hi <laughs> Jo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If those players go up at approximately the same time and and are fighting for the ball, uh, and a call is made one way or another, right? So you call you call um, A for for basket interference uh, in that situation. You go to review it and you determine that there was basket interference, but B was the one um, that touched the ball. So you can you can reverse that and put the basket interference on B and award team A two points in that scenario. Now, you know, you can't do it if that ball is up on the rim for a long period of time. You know, every once in a while you see it, you know, once every couple of weeks where that ball is just bouncing from one side to the other and you got – you know, a player from one side jumps up um, and then a player, you know, from the other side of the rim will jump up. Um, that's not the same play. Right. So you couldn't you couldn't switch it in that scenario. But if they jump up at about the same time and, and are fighting for it and you're just missing, you know, one hand for the other, you can flip that call at that point. What you're telling me is there's going to be a little a little bit of leeway there when they go to the monitor to get the call right. There is correct, correct, right. and 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 that's the key, right? That's why we have replay, is to get the call right. Uh, another question here is uh, the screener. I know you covered this a little bit, guys, but the screener rolling into we're seeing so much pick and roll out top. The legality of the screener rolling into a defender. If you want to cover that quickly, yeah, absolutely. I have, I, and I have a couple of those plays too. Yep. Uh, okay, so a screener roll. It's a process play. So it's not an immediate whistle play because a lot of times it's a switch. So what we talk about is seeing the entire play. And if that on ball defender makes no attempt to continue to guard and sort of just grabs the screener and they kind of move down the lane together, I'm more likely to pass on that because that's a switch. Second part of that is once the defender, the on ball defender, you know, reaches out and does something to the screener where they grab or hold or whatever, Really hard for me to put an illegal screen on that play at that point because the defender has initiated contact. Got it. But if the screener, so if you go up and short of contact and then the screener moves before contact, here's how, and here's how we referee that play. If the screener, and, and this is the teaching point, if the on-ball defender goes under the screen and he does so before the actually screen is set and the screener rolls, more than likely, that's going to be an illegal screen. The uh, responsibility for contact will be on the screener. If the screener is going to go, or if the defender is going to go over the top of the screen, then we're looking for a 10-1-4 foul on the defender, because generally, if a foul occurs, he's going to be going over the top, and now he's going to bump into the, to the ball handler, and now we have a 10-1-4 foul, some sort of hand check, body check. So defender goes under the screen, responsibility for contact or onus will be on that screener more than more than not. But if that defender grabs or holds or something, all bets are off. And if that defender makes no attempt, you know, don't, don't, you know, grab the screen and say, Oh, I was trying to get, uh, you know, you, so you got to process these plays and you got to say, Hey, that's a switch, not a screen. And Every play is different. And, you know, I don't try, you know, it's, it's, and what's your problem? Here's the thing, what you guys are seeing, you know, in your mind's eye may be different than what I'm seeing in my mind's eye, but I know I put two or three screens on there uh, so, so to talk about that, to address that point. That happens a lot. My point to coaches is teach it right. If you if you open if you open up and roll into a moving defender underneath, it's probably not good technique from my point of view. Um, Jeff, one thing that I, I, I asked this a couple of weeks ago and it's come up here today is the idea that the monitor review of a basket interference goaltending is going to automatically take place at the first dead ball under four minutes. 
uh, right, because of an electronic timeout? No, at the four minute mark, you're going to go immediately after the. Oh, call. at the four. Okay, great. So there's yeah. no perfect. That's so there's no chance of a a play at four oh three that uh, there's no dead ball until a minute fifty when the game is really in the in the balance. Well, at four oh three, you you would wait at that point to to the media timeout to All the right, under so four that's media my question. timeout. My question yep. would be: ha, Did the rules committee sense that there might be a play? That happens at 4:03, and at the end of a game, there's no dead ball until so let's just let's go crazy and say a minute 11. When now you're yeah. going to adjudicate that, that's not going to be a problem for you think for the for you guys. No, I, I of course it's going to be a problem for him. <laughs> just because you brought it up, it's going to be a problem. Okay. No, but the right. so what you know the the key in kind of crafting this rule was to was to mirror the 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 rule for a two to a three review, right? So it would be that that same situation, Fran, where if you have a two to a three point shot happening at 403 and you don't know if it was a two or three, you're not going to review that until that media timeout at that point. So it's it's the same the same thought process. We, I, okay. What we didn't want to do is put in yet another um, set of rules for, for re reviewing. Um, so we wanted to try and keep it at least some consistency there. So we have those two that are married together, the two okay. to three in the basket interference goal timing. This will be an easy one, but any mon any coach request of a monitor review that is overturned, the call is overturned, there is no charge timeout. That I know that's correct. But so yep, any, that is any correct. Of those requests. Okay, just that that's been asked. Um, Troy, I think we're good. Uh I, I would just ask, you know what? I would ask you guys, give you one last chance. Are there any rules, Chris, that you think, I mean, just off the top of your head, that from a standpoint of a coach, is there any like miss rule that's misinterpreted often during the year where you go, man, I wish the coach knew that rule. Um, I don't know if anything pops out. Oh boy, that's 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 you know. a big list, Fran. Yeah. Well, give, no, give us one that you funny. think like, you know, maybe it's backcourt over and back. You know, uh, it's the subtle ones, right? It's the it's the it's those, right? It's yeah. the subtle ones where you know it's control or you know that's why it wasn't backcourt because there was no team control things like that and and look and i would just say for the most part because you know i've been wrong i was wrong you know in my career up until september 1 2022 when i took this job i haven't been wrong since but look we make mistakes as officials okay and we even misapply a rule i mean it, it happens i'm not gonna say we never do but I would just I would trust that the referee probably knows the rule, especially if it's a, you know, if it's a one off. It's one of those weird ones. Just yeah. trust that they know the rule. Yeah, I would say the case book is great for that, coaches. If you get a copy of the case man. book, just put it by your recliner at man. night. Yeah. Just read ten pages, man. Stuff happens that'll make you look like you're a genius, and then you might have a TV job after that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think generally, though. Yeah, coaches are getting better, much better. With that's them. great. It's good to know. Jeff, you want to add to that? You know, just actually the, the one thing, and I failed to mention it early on, but the one little tweak to the uh, rule this year that wasn't really a major change, but it's something we're kind of going back to the future on is, you know, a player who's jumping out of bounds and gaining possession of the ball can now call a timeout. They don't have to be on the floor. So, you know, a player jumping out of bounds, catches a ball, can call a timeout, or if they're jumping from front court to back court. Um, they can catch the ball and call a timeout. So that that is that's the way the rule was, Franny, when when you were yeah. coaching, um, and uh, the committee wanted to go back to that. Let's go back and add to that because in the last two minutes, as we discussed yesterday, you can call it a coach can call a timeout, airborne player going out of bounds, possession of the ball under two minutes, the coach can call timeout. That is correct. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's hard. It, it, that's a hard play for a referee, especially if it's. Um, you know, if the coach is on the far end of the floor, it's kind of hard for a, a referee to process all of that. So they may not get granted the timeout, but by rule, that can happen where a but coach can call a timeout. If you're a coach practicing that, your players on the court can call timeout. Absolutely. Yes, any any of the players. Any of the players on the court. John, uh, I've only gone you last, John, because we're going left to right on my screen. So um, <laughs> is there anything that you want to add uh those two guys are the big dogs. Let me, let me just leave this back with the coach's mentality. Yes. We've been here an hour and a half now, and there's been really some great discussion. 
um, our referees, they have to take the test and score 85%. And I'm going to go back to what we talked about a little bit yesterday, Fran. <clears throat> I still go back. You made a comment before we started. One to two calls, one to two questions in a game that could be a difference maker. And I've never understood if you're in a, a, a power five school or if you're at a JUCO and you may be the only coach or if you have an assistant, why somebody wouldn't want to know the rules. And I'm going to leave it with this example. Last Saturday, I watched a football game. I got beat late and his comment was, I didn't know when I could go to a replay. And I put this to basketball as a season gets ready. If you have a coach on your sideline that knows a rule book, maybe can take the NCAA test. I don't know if they can do that or not, but know that they know when to ask or when you, you can see where Chris and Jeff have done a great job with rules and mechanics of trying to make this an easier game to where referees and coaches work together, reviewing this stuff, the different things. I think if they could have one of your assistants, an assistant, a GA or something, know your rule book. We talked about this last year on an NABC call I did with D2 coaches. And I got a lot of nice comments. They had never thought of it. So I want to reiterate what you said an hour and a half ago, the importance of having somebody on your staff know the rules so you know what to ask. I, I, I've, I've been, a, I think you, Chris knows, uh, Jeff knows, I'm an advocate of coaches because that was my profession for many years. I still get to coach and not lose games, but I'm also advocate of officials because these guys, as I've seen through the years, are the best of the best. They care about the game. They care about the job they do. And and it's it's we're one sport. It's one team. And uh, I think the best feeling in the world, Chris, is when I see the guys in Lubbock at 7 in the morning and we're all catching flights to Dallas, when I say to the three guys, I didn't mention you guys once last night. That's always a good feeling because the officials, for the most part, do not want to be part of the game other than to make sure – the game goes smoothly within the rules and uh, it's not a good feeling. I think you'd agree, Chris, when a, a controversy happens and, a, and, a, and a, an official's name is mentioned coast to coast the next day on social media. Yeah. Sleepless nights. Fran. Yeah. 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 So this is a, uh, Hey, uh, for everybody who stayed on, we had, a, we had nearly 300 today, Troy, uh, for much of this. Uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this because of my passion for the rules and coaches, I would just continue to tell you um, to work with uh, officials. The relationships are fun. You'll really have fun with them once you both leave the profession and you're having a beer somewhere in the summer and, and talk about, uh, <laughs> you know. But but in the, at the, in the meantime, I think it's great, Troy, that we had a great uh, following. We had a great uh, following today. I, I would agree, Coach. And I want to reiterate to everybody, uh, thanks for for participating and i want to thank the panelists again i know uh, you're getting hit by a lot of people to do a lot of stuff this time of year um so it but it's been very helpful and we're very appreciative of it pleasure troy uh, thanks for the ask thank you thanks everybody and uh we'll see you guys down the road